call the afternoon session to order. Um, and our first speaker will be an invited speaker. So this is a 30 minute talk with hopefully about five minutes, including five minutes for questions. And so Martin Muser joins us uh, from, I believe you're, I assume you're in Saarbrücken. <laughs> I'm in Saarbrücken, yes, yes uh, I am. All right, well welcome and the floor is yours. Okay, wait a second. I need to get my PowerPoint working. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, you can. Okay, I can get my laser pointer now. Oh, wait a second. My laser pointer I can get here. All right, so thanks for the invitation. Sorry that I couldn't make my way to Trieste. It's always an exciting place to be. And actually, the last time I went, I had a very pleasant encounter with somebody I was asked to share a few words about. Um, so Erio and Andrea asked me to make a few comments on Mark Robbins and his contributions to the field. Um, <clears throat> now I find it very hard to do that in a few minutes because Mark had so many, many outstanding contributions. Um, yet it may be worth uh, emphasizing a few. Um, I think the first really big milestone he left was on the melting or sliding induced melting of a boundary lubricant, which would basically pull out energy from motion, but the recrystallization would not propel the system. And so he suggested a very important mechanism, which is uh, responsible for stick slip. Um, in later work, I uh, also on boundary lubricants, where I had the privilege to be involved, uh, he emphasized once more the importance of boundary lubricants and explained how the presence of a boundary lubricant would make two solids pin, which may otherwise um, be super lubic. And moreover, he showed that in a case where you have two stiff solids in contact, where you get large normal stresses, where at the microscopic scale, you would see friction loss that very much would look like those that you have on the macro scale. And I think these topics pertain very much to the theme of, of this conference and have left a, a deep impression in the field. Um, he also opened up a new field, the simulation of rough contacts where we got very important information on what are the stresses, what actually happens when we have nominally flat surfaces, how does it affect adhesion? He did that together with Lars Pastewka, who is in the audience. But he also made contributions outside of tribology where he always kept asking seemingly simple questions with a very, very big impact. For example, why do colloidal systems so frequently condense in BCC, body-centered cubic systems, and not in dense phases as, as we would suggest. So this was also one of his uh, milestone contributions. Um, in my opinion, he was the most uh, prolific modeler in the tribological community uh, and certainly a front runner in the bigger field of condensed matter physics, stat Mac, and materials physics. And actually when I first got to know him, he gave a talk at Rockefeller University um, in New York uh, and he was introduced as a computational physicist who does not produce numbers, but insight. And I think that really um, describes Mark's scientific contributions um, very, very much. He also had a deep personal impact on people's life because of his generosity. And uh, I just mentioned one that affected me personally. Mark and I, we hadn't talked uh, I think in two years, not because we were hostile, there was no opportunity, we didn't exchange emails, and out of the blue, I get an email where he says, look, in your hometown, there is a job opening, today is the deadline, don't you want to apply? And so he thought of me, and, and I don't even know why he remembers my small, little, pathetic hometown, uh, uh, but so he did, and, and I moved, and, and that really changed my life, because I got back from Canada, where I was personally not very happy. I moved to Germany. Um, I met my second wife, and so now we have two children. 
And the reason why I mention this is that I show one picture that is a nice transition to the thing I would like to talk about, which is tribal electricity. So um, my son has fewer hair, so I couldn't show him and he looks like me and I wanted to spare that uh, for you. Um, but here you see uh, something that is, is very well known actually since the time of Thales, um, where the rubbing action between solids induces electricity, which then makes our hair stand up if we jump on a trampoline in a dry um, summer day. And uh, the classical experiments involved an amber stick and biological matter. So you have an amber stick and a cat and you rub the amber against the cat and the amber becomes negative. And the cat, cat plus iron gives a cat iron. So the cat iron sits on the cat. And um, it's a bit controversially discussed what is the origin of that um, electrostatic charging. Um, in principle, you could think it's simple uh, because there can only be two mechanisms. There can be electron transfer or there can be ion transfer. I mean, these are the two ways how you can basically charge a surface. And, and you would think figuring out which one it is, it's a lot simpler than figuring out what friction mechanism dominates. I would argue there are roughly, let's say 10 to 12 or 15 different friction mechanisms. But for charge transfer, it's simple. You have electrons or ions. And as, as long as you get two metals in contact, it seems an easy story. Um, the electrons go to the solid with a greater work function. And, and this is also experimentally observed. But it becomes a bit more tricky as it comes to dielectric. And um, the big trouble here, I'm, I'm quoting uh, George Whitesides out of an article that was the first review I read on, on uh, tribal electricity. Uh, Daniel Lex also has very nice articles uh, in the recent past, but uh, this was the first one that I read. And he basically says, look, in a lot of the systems that charge, uh, that get tribal charged, you have a big band gap, so you wouldn't really expect electronic flow. But if you look at the ions, they're also immobile. And, and so not really clear what is the mechanism if we think of uh, Taylor's cat, though apparently Taylor's didn't do the experiments himself, he only knew about them. Even more so, uh, there is a big riddle where often you get what is called a uh, cyclic triboelectric series where basically zinc picks up a negative charge from glass, picks up a negative charge, uh, so silk picks up a negative charge from zinc and so on and so forth. And it's a bit like in the painting by Escher where you keep going downhill, 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 but uh, that doesn't really make sense. We know we cannot really go in circles and um, so I got curious in the question of, of modeling this uh, to find an answer to these type of questions. Um, yeah, so the mechanisms are known uh, as in friction. It's, it's more the question of which one is more important under what circumstances and what parameter favors one over the other. And that calls for modeling. And uh, so I'm, uh, by nature, a modeler who likes to use potentials because then we can use a few thousand or a few hundred thousand atoms. And so when we do want to model tribal electricity, we must be in a position to assign charges on the fly. We cannot say you are a lithium atom or ion, you have to charge zero or plus one. The atoms have to figure out themselves what charge they want to be at. And, and the next few minutes I spent on stuff that I did eight years ago, but I'm in the process of getting back to it. So I thought it might be nice to talk about it again. So what we need to do from a modeling point of view is we have to chop up our nature into finite elements or into atoms. And then what we need is we need a description that says what is the potential energy um, as a function of the atomic charges that we assign 
And, and usually what you try to do or what you assume when you do an electronic structure calculation is you assume that the system tends to find the minimum of this, uh, of this function here. So what has been traditionally done is that you write down your sign charges to atoms, QN is the charge on atom N, and you write down something like a energy expression uh, where you say an atom with a large electronegativity wants to attract negative charge. So this is what drives the charge on an atom. Too much charge on an atom starts to repel itself, right? So we cannot put a charge of minus three on an oxygen atom. It doesn't like that. So this term would be called the chemical hardness. And then we have the Coulomb interaction, which may be screened. Um, and, and then we minimize this thing with respect to the charges and assume we can be happy. Uh, now DFT does something similar, uh, except that DFT doesn't discretize space towards atom, but it's in a, in a charge equilibration model that I'm talking about now, the energy is a function of discrete charges and in DFT it's a functional of a continuous electron density, but the philosophy is very similar. Now, if we do that, we run into a big trouble which is that if we separate atoms from each other, let's say we separate a methane molecule from a water molecule, uh, the molecules end up with non-integer charges. Um, we have a superlinear polarizability of polymers with a chain length. Uh, our dielectric constants are always infinitely large, so we are formally correspond to a solid. And uh, the dipoles of an alcohol chain are linear in the length of the chain, which is not really meaningful either. So this problem we managed to fix by saying that uh, um, if we assign charges to a molecule, here is a, a hydrogen terminated uh, silica molecule, um, we can donate a partial charge only to a neighboring atom. And what we have to do is paying basically pushing partial charge across a bond needs to be penalized uh, with a bond stiffness term. And so this was a combination of potentials that existed before that were atom based or bond based and this model was a split between the two. And uh, now on the fly, we determine the charges using this method and it works great. It produces meaningful dissociation limits. It leads to more transferable charge assignment schemes it has the correct size dependent polarizability. And this parameter of the bond stiffness can be easily related to a dielectric constant. But the correct dissociation limit is not only uh, uh, a blessing, but it's also a curse because whenever we separate two charges, eventually when we separate, let's say a chlorine mol atom from a sodium, Eventually, the sodium says, give me my charge back because my, my ionization energy is greater than your electron affinity. And so at very large separations, we always go back to a uniquely charged um, uh, state. Oops. So here you see in the movie, what happens is uh, any physicist will recognize that this is an amber rod and, and, and this is a cat, right? So it cannot be mistaken. So we approach with the rod to the cat. It picks up a negative charge. Uh, the cat picks up positive charge. But as we go back, uh, the charge goes back. And, and DFT actually suffers a bit from the same problem because like any other method that assigns charges or charge density on a unique minimization principle, um, your charge state depends exclusively on the atomic positions, but it has no history dependence added to it. But we do have a history dependence. Uh, for example, if you separate an NaCl molecule and you do it very slowly in a nonpolar solvent, uh, you will end up with two neutral atoms. But if you separate them very quickly or in a polar solvent, which you later evaporate, you are going to end up with a positive charged cation and a negatively charged chlorine ion, uh, anion. So, uh, and simulations need to reflect that so that we can model triboelectricity. 
So what we did is we introduced a new variable to the classical potentials where we said we have to develop potentials relative to the oxidation state. So a Cl minus atom is a completely different species than a chlorine atom and the force field has to develop for each of those fields. And, and uh, basically this oxidation number is not subjected to a bond hardness. And otherwise we do everything as before. And now when the amber rod approaches a cat, it can pick up charge. And uh, so here we basically model things with an electron charge transfer where there is no ion that crosses the interface, but there is charge because the charge wants to swap. Uh, when the amber rod and the cat are close to each other, the charge is happy when it swaps. And when it's pulled too far away, it's kinetically hindered to do the transition. And um, in a way we could argue we have a, a dissipation mechanism uh, because it costs more energy to pull the tip away than to approach it. So whenever you have hysteresis, um, that leads to energy dissipation and triboelectricity certainly is one of the mechanisms that uh, we haven't really studied so much and it might be worth to do so um, in the future. Um, now we can do the same thing for metals. Uh, when we switch on metals, you see the charge of a metal wants to sit on the surface, you get much more charge flow. And once we did this, we actually noticed, hey, now we can do, now we can model actually the discharge of a battery which we did. So we have an anode, an electrolyte, and a cathode. And whenever you close the switch here, you basically get uh, charge transfer and, and that is irreversible. So in a way, when you close the switch, you get tribal charging. And if you open it again, the charge doesn't go back. And, and so uh, once we had the model down to simulate tribal charging, the first thing we actually did um, was to look uh, set up a simulation of a small scale battery uh, where the anode could basically pass electrons through an external resistor to the other side. The switch would be closed. The charge would flow proportional to the voltage between the anode and the cathode, which DFT would always level to zero. Uh, and then we could measure the flow and we could basically see the discharge curves for different resistances. And that actually matched experiments fairly well, which we only see one year later. So this voltage time was really a prediction and not a post-diction. So we didn't have this dual cell battery uh, in front of us when uh, we did the calculations. Now the trouble of all these calculations that are presented is they're all done with Poi models. So we take Leonard Jones and we add a complete redox scheme on it. And uh, we want to move towards more realistic chemistry. And one of the steps to do that uh, actually also took a long time ago. Um, so let's go back to tribal electricity and ask the question, what are the ways to actually produce ions? And one of the things we noticed when we worked on decomposition products or what we expected to be decomposition products of anti-wear additives was that stress could produce ions. And I'll show you the slide in a minute and I will elaborate on that uh, also a bit more. So imagine you have neutral molecules to begin with, uh, you add stress, and then what can happen is when you remove the stress, uh, you get a modification where one uh, molecule is negatively charged and the other one is positively charged. And we found such a reaction in triphosphoric acid, which you see here, where at a pressure of 3.5 gigapascal, uh, a hydrogen would move from one triphosphoric acid molecule to the other, leaving behind a negatively charged group here, a positively charged group there, the reaction was endothermic, but still it was very persistent up to, I don't know how high we heated up, 2000 Kelvins. And uh, so this uh, very stable compounds, even though it's a bit strange to have a protonated acid molecule. And uh, in recent work, when I went back to look in one of my favorite topics, which is uh, the functionality of anti-wear additives, we basically asked the question, what is the role of stress in chemistry? And we discovered very much to our surprise that 
it really affects the way how ions are generated. Uh, one step back, actually, there's a great paper by Nernst in 1896, where he basically argued, if you have any gradient at an interface, be it stress, be it temperature, of course, concentration, and you get a gradient across an interface, you get what he called touch electricity. And the arguments he put forth are exactly the arguments that we should discuss again, perhaps more often. What Nance didn't know at the time, he didn't know about electrons yet, and he didn't know about the symmetry of the onsaga coefficients. But otherwise, my impression is that Nance had it down. And there was another fellow that I can talk about, Knobloch is his name, uh, a German Jewish uh, scientist who uh, uh, disappeared then in the 30s. He has great contributions to the field, which are absolutely worth reading and astounding, given that they didn't even know about the existence of electrons. Anyway, coming back. Coming back to real life systems, uh, we have here two molecules of what uh, collaborators of mine and I expected to be decomposition products of zinc phosphates that are used as lubricant additives. Uh, the functionality I don't want to discuss here, I just want to focus on the ions. And we add to that two triphosphoric acid molecules. And once we densify this moderately, we actually get a long molecule uh, with a zinc phosphate backbone and kind of funky side groups, which however, pack very nicely into a cubic simulation cell. And now we ask the question, what happens to the system depending on a deformation mode? So we can compress it isotropically uh, as it would happen in a diamond endel cell. But if you think of a tip, if you think just of a mechanical contact where you touch down with a tip, the material underneath the tip wants to basically push to the side, but it can't because there's other matter already sitting there. So we, take, we took two extreme point of views where we said, let's make a uniaxial compression um, where the material is not allowed to breathe. And then let's make a compression where the system is allowed to breathe to the extent that the system is volume conserving. So I would argue that real life is somewhere between this area conserving and volume conserving condition. And what you get is you get implicit shear. So you don't necessarily apply a shear force on the surface, but because the stress tensor is not diagonal anymore, uh, you have a deviatoric stress or phonesis stress or shear stress, whatever you want to call it. And then we made the interesting observation that depending on the type of compression mode, the system transformed in a very different way. So as we added isotropic compression, we had a truly exothermic, uh, uh, exothermic uh, 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 reaction, if you wish where the energy gain per zinc atom was 0.7 EV. Oh, I forgot the units here, so 0.7 EV. And the system was very, very stiff. Um, when we did the same with uniaxial area conserving, we got a similar stiffening, but we gained much less energy during the compression. And when we did this in a volume conserving fashion, we barely gained any energy and the bulk modulus, the stiffening was not as big. And here, not surprising, actually what the systems are trying to do when they're under non-isotropic stress, uh, they're trying to become isotropic. And then once you release the stress again, you'd be soft along the direction parallel to which you have compressed. And so I think I'm convinced that happens in the tribological contacts. And if the chairman of the session ever manages to cut out a, a zinc phosphate tribal layer. And, and, and Rob, if you ever manage to measure the stiffness normal and perpendicular to the old compression direction, um, I would cook you a great dinner, okay? Uh, so what do we see on the charges? We see something very, very interesting, I find. Uh, so here I just show you one case for the area conserving compression which is the phonesis stress didn't really go up so much. 
But at a strain of 0.1 or 0.15, we found 10 mobile hydrogen atoms or protons. And what do I mean with mobile hydrogen atoms? At one value of stress, we run a simulation of roughly 20 picoseconds, and we counted the number of protons that had changed the oxygen that they had been bonded to. And what we see is actually the stresses were not very big. So the hydrostatic stresses were one gigapascal or two gigapascal, something that you can easily, easily achieve in a tribological contact between two stiff materials. There was this whole large bunch of mobile protons in the interface. And then again, Nance's argument, you have a gradient across the interface, be it chemical, be it stress, and boom, you get a charge transfer. As we kept compressing further, again, you would see that the number of charges go up. And even in a small cell like this, uh, on average, 10.5 um, ions or protons change the oxygen number, oxygen atom they were bonded to. Then a coordination change of zinc occurred. And, and the Lewis structures, uh, yeah. And after that, the number of mobile ions decreased. So stress and actually not only hydrostatic stress, really the exact shape of the stress tensor appears to have a tremendous effect on how the atoms charge uh, there. And here you see the structures after decompression. So after we decompress the samples, um, we see a lot of Twitter ions where in the, in the hydrostatic compression, we get a negatively charged oxygen here, a positively charged there, so this group is only bonded via Coulomb interaction to the zinc. So you could argue we have produced a cation, which is a protonated phosphoric acid, uh, which then in an interface might decide to go to the other side of the interface. Um, and under shear, we get actually uh, here, the shear is the largest. We get a very large number of ions. We get two cations produced nearby, and then a doubly charged uh, counter charge here. And, and again, the type of chemistry we do under shear really depends very much on the shear stress. And I think this has important ramifications or implications uh, for the triboelectric series, which is A, we observe that Twitter ions are produced at very low contact pressures. Uh, the nature and the number of the stress-induced ions depends sensitively on the shape of the stress tensor not only on the compressive stress or the hydrostatic stress, it depends on shear stress and the hydrostatic stress. The larger the deviatoric stresses, the easier it seems to be to promote the ion formation. And <clears throat> any system in which charge transfer is triggered by ion transfer, I'm not saying that all of them are, I'm not saying I explain everything, but those that do tribal charging in a system that has a very stress dependent number of ions simply cannot be assigned um, a unique positioning in the triboelectric series. Uh, I would say that for the class of tribal charging that I was looking at, uh, what you should generally have in a triboelectric series is at least two stiff materials where you get very high, high contact pressures and one where you are soft and, and then it's almost unavoidable to have this type of, of series. So actually I was faster than I was supposed to be. I was uh, supposed to hurry. Uh, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, Sergei Suhomlinov. He ran the simulations on the zinc phosphate. Um, Wolf Dub joined, uh, supported me in the journey um, uh, doing the beginning, the uh, uh, battery simulations, and the tribal charging of this uh, cat. Um, if anyone is interested in continuing this type of work, I'm looking for postdocs uh, who like this type of research. Uh, also, my big thank you goes to Mark Robbins for introducing me to the field. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So we have time for a few questions. Thanks for that inspiring talk.
I wondered for my whole life why, am why Amber gets charged when you rub a cat, but I still don't understand it. Why does it happen? <laughs> Uh, we don't, uh, we can say it either yet. Uh, so um, our plan is to look at the response of carotene to stress uh, if it pops off positive charges. Um, so what I said today was again, a little bit of a proof of principle study. And I think one has to be very, very careful um, in the selection of the materials where we try to understand how does stress build up. But uh, actually our skin appears to be soft, but the top layer is actually fairly rigid. Uh, uh, so the um, epidermis has a Young's modulus, I believe of close to four gigapascal. So you can get very high pressures in the very top layer at very small scales. And amber is also not exactly soft. It's also is about the four gigapascal. So I wouldn't be surprised if when you rub amber against an organic substance that is carotene based, that you get stresses locally in the order of gigapascal where you could create mobile ions. And once you have mobile ions, I suppose you agree with me, it's pretty obvious that you are going to have pro, uh, uh, ion transfer, most likely protons if they're around because they're the most mobile, but making a really quantitative prediction, that is the challenging part. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Martin. Um, as far as I understand that uh, uh, the contact electrification is what triggers uh, from, the, from the beginning the all the uh, charge uh, separation and all the charge uh, related uh, ionization. And uh, so, but all the dynamical effects, so you are taking into account uh, is what makes this, this thing complicated. In particular, you have to go beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and beyond uh, all the static uh, as you show. Well, I, I think if you have ion transfer, you get away with born Oppenheimer. So the systems that I looked at, the, the, the phosphor systems, uh, the band structure or the band gap barely depends on, uh, 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 barely depends on the stress. So we always get a band gap of about 4.5 to 5 EV in the realm of DFT. So, which is always well, taken to be taken with a grain yeah. of salt, but we really don't see that. So, so I think we can live for a long time with the born Oppenheim approximation. And I think at the point where the ions are separated over a distance that is large enough for no tunneling to occur, that's the point where we basically do the conical intersection if we wish, or where we change the Landau Zener level, if you're a physicist, but then it's too late for the electrons to cross back. So I think if it's ion transfer, you can get away with von Oppenheimer, but you have to be careful that when the surfaces are really separated, that you don't get an unphysical, let me call it unphysical electron tunneling current yeah. that DFT can find because DFT can do a global energy minimization, but nature has to find a way through the vacuum where the electrons don't want to be, right? So, so this is why this is such a hard problem for DFT. And perhaps with classical simulations, we can get a bit further where we put in a bit of the phenomenology by hand and where we don't get a tunneling current. Okay, and you know what, there's one question in the chat. So Martin, if you're able to take a look and perhaps if you can try to do a quick answer to that one. Uh, oh, wait a second, but then I have to, okay, can you read it to me? Because I see only my- I, Is there anybody on Zoom who can read the chat? Slide. I don't have access to the computer myself, but hopefully someone in the room does. Is anybody well, someone, on Zoom? Uh, is, is, is some of the other remote guys, uh, yeah. can you please read it, it to me? The question is, what about the temperature dependence of tribocharging? And this is from Andres Vernish. Does tribocharging have a temperature dependence? Thank you. Uh, it certainly will, uh, but I don't want to make any predictions at the point. So, so what I really want to do is I, I want to parameterize force fields, uh, and then I can start to answer these questions. But, but currently, I have the tools, uh, but I don't have the potentials yet to really look into that. Uh, perhaps a little bit. I, no, I actually, I don't know. I, I think if temperature is higher, 
uh, perhaps I can give an answer after all. Once you pull the surfaces out of contact, um, there is an energy barrier for the ions to go back where they want to be. And if temperature is high, that is going to happen more quickly. So uh, my belly feeling says if temperature goes up, you reduce the tribal charging because ions have an easier time to go through a barrier to the place where they actually want to be. But that answer may depend on the specific system. I, yeah. You referred to some work we and others are doing, uh, and that is, uh, uh, and I wanted to share, yes, actually we are starting to look at sulfur-free and even some zinc-free phosphate esters and others as tribofilm additives. And the second point I wanted to share is Laurie Marks is going to be giving a talk uh, in this uh, symposium, and he, which I believe is focused on work he has been doing both uh, experimentally and, and, uh, and uh, calculations of how flexor electricity stress-induced charging from bending occurs. We have to move on to the next speaker to stay on time. I see there was a question from Lori, but maybe we'll have him address it when he gives his talk. <laughs> and let's think. I hope I can make yeah. it to Lori's talk because it's, I have to teach. I have a busy uh, week, but I'm trying to make it. Lori, uh, it's okay? a con I'll, I'll read his comment. It is for some cases, e.g., uh, sliding shot key contacts, the temperature dependence follows thermionic emission. So, uh, comment about the temperature dependence. Okay. Very good. All right, great discussion. Uh, let's thank Martin for a very stimulating talk. Thank you.